All right, so let's get us started. So um, I guess next semester, no, it's not, not next, semester, next week we are going to have a spring break. Um, how are you guys doing in the term of uh, term of projects? Good. And and homeworks like the, I think the last homeworks are, are really so is it fine or harder easier compared to previous one? Harder. Yeah, harder. Is it like the the, the the gap is significant or okay harder but like uh, is it significant? Is it what? Is it just, I don't know if it's significant or not. It's just it's like it seemed harder and it specifically said there would be. Is it because it's longer or is it because it's just questions are long? I'd say because it's longer because I haven't like okay. <laughs> All right. So so let's talk about um belief propagation loopy belief propagation. We discussed belief propagation in Lecture six and maybe lecture seven. I think you guys have seen different versions of this a uh, couple of uh, last lectures. We also talked about classical question that he asked me for from graphical models. So, for example, we might be interested in computing the, the marginal likelihood of the data given a model. Sometimes we are interested in computing the marginal. Uh, probability of a subset of variables, for example, if I have all set of variables and A is a set of vertices, we, we, I might be interested in computing the marginal probability of PA. PA can be singleton, can be double, can, can be any other set of variables. Sometimes we are interested in computing um, a, a conditional posterior probability of a, 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 a node, for example, or graphical model is an example of the conditional. And another examples are uh, computing maximum assignment or maximum posterior uh, estimation. So these are examples of the of the inference problem that we deal with in graphical model. So we talked about different approaches to compute these queries. Uh, of course, one of the first algorithms that we saw was brute force. So, for example, in the context of um, discrete random variables, one way would be well computing any of these. Uh, marginals or possible probabilities, one easy way would, well, not easy way, brute force would be like going over all of the random variables, but we saw that that's really not a good idea, especially even if for very small number of variables, latent var variables that can explode computationally. We talked about elimination algorithm. Uh, if you remember the, the one that like we pushed the sum inside, and then he said, okay, so if the, the, the graphical model is simple, I can see how to push that sum because the ordering of how I push that sum inside was important. That brought us to message passing algorithm, which is basically a mechanical way of uh, doing that uh, variable elimination. Um, we talked about how this message passing is a very general way of uh, that forward backward algorithm that you have seen in machine learning course. And we said that, well, with, the, with just change of the sum to the max, you can compute the maximum posterior estimation with message passing, but the, the machinery is the same. In context of that, so we, we talked only about the exact algorithm. We said that uh, how, for a given uh, graphical model, we can convert that to the junction tree and pass the messages in the junction tree instead of doing it on the on a, uh, in a factor graph. So um, hopefully you guys remember this idea that, so the idea was that like, let's say we have a soldier, and these soldiers are connected, and they want to count the number of soldiers in their squad, and they, they send a message, and, and they receive a message, and at the end we have a, so when all of the mes messages are received, they form a belief. And that was basically the general idea of a message pass. We also saw the form of the algorithm that we, uh, the, the run through message passing that uh, if we use a factor graph as a representation of the uh, graph graph model, the form of the, uh, the operation that we do in, in a factors and in the nodes are as follows that if the node receives, when a, a node receives a message from uh, all of the, the neighbors' uh, nodes in the graph, so this is 
psi i is a, is a factor node and the signals represent random variables. They apply their belief on it and they send a message to the, to the next node. So these are all the things that we have seen in the lecture 6, 7, and so on. And we mentioned that the operation, for at least for a, a random, uh, discrete random variables, the operation that is done on, on the factors are uh, matrix vector product. Hopefully you guys remember that. But then problem arise when um, your graph is not um, three, so it has some loops. So we said that when you don't have that many random variables, um, well, if, even if you have loops, one way to do that is to produce a junction tree. And what was the idea of a junction tree? So given a graph, how can I get the junction tree? So I have to do some modification to the structure of the graph. What, what was those uh, operations? Do you guys remember? Given a graphical model, I want to make a junction tree. What are the things that I have to do to the graph? It's OK to be wrong. Just um, do some operation. Yes? I change that to non directed graph. Yes. And, uh, turn it into a big tree. Put, put tree. Yeah. Click tree. Okay. That's, that's correct. But before going to click tree, so let's say that I have a undirected graph for now. Moralized. Yes. And then there was something else after moralization. So moralization was whenever there is a V structure, I have to marry all of those couples that have an office spring, but they're mat not married. They're just couple them together, but there was something else that I needed. Change that to quarter. Yes, change it to the quarter graph. So can you tell me what's a quarter graph? An integral uh, with edges of letters and four pieces of edges. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So, so, the quarter, so that quarter graph operation, that converting graph to quarter graph called triangulation. So basically, the, so I have to convert this. So, so for this graph, so this is a loop. But there is no chord, so I'm just going to connect them through this node. And then when I have this, I have this loop, right? But there is two nodes here that, there are two nodes here that are not connected to each other to a chord. So I have to introduce a new chord and so on and so forth. And then from that, I get the junction tree. But then what was the problem with this approach? I mean, OK, it works. But computation, what was the problem? So I got from here triangulation to a junction tree, and these are the size of my clicks. When I have a graph, do you remember what was the issue? So, so computation scales with the size of the maximum clicks. Exactly. So, you more exactly. so that was the issue that, well, you can do exact inference, but if you're, if, uh, if you're, if the size of your clicks increases, you're just like, you're, you know, like you're hiding your computation somewhere else. And anyway, so uh, putting computation aside, because we're going to talk about it in a, in a couple of minutes. So we said that another, uh, so whenever we, we build this junction tree, um, so uh, for the junction tree, we can do message passing on the junction tree. And the form of message passing was we have a set of uh, clicks and set of uh, separators and the form of uh, the message that we pass through that uh, passed, uh, has the following uh, form. All right, so and then we said that um, while these loops happen all the time, an example of that was when we wanted to tag the, the labels of these patches in this image, and we said that just looking at the, uh, at the, at the appearance of the patch is not enough because you know blue does not always mean sky. And, and the, the, the sea can be on the top of the land, depends on the context. So we run into problems like this, that we have a graph that are loopy, and may have so many random variables. So how can we, so it's not, so we cannot avoid loop, and we cannot get away with uh, algorithm that only works in small number of random variables. So today lecture is gonna address this problem that what if there are loops? And how can we do? How can we run an inference algorithm for the graph that has lots of random values? So we have to resort to an approximation. So we talked about in the context of Markov random field. I show you this graph that, for example, if I want so, so let's say that, so here are 
x1, x2, uh, x3, and so on and so forth. And these are the factors. And let's say for now they're binary. And these are the form of the Gibbs distribution that I have for them, like the interactions and the unary term. And the thetas are the, 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 uh, the parameters of this graph. And I mentioned that, uh, well, if you do vari variable elimination, what kind of problem happens here? I think you guys already said that, but I want somebody to mention. So what would happen if I do variable elimination here? Start, I think I showed you this uh, slide before. Complexity exponentially grows. Yeah, complexity of what? So that's true. Of that's the true. Potentials that you, you introduce that exactly. So so every time that I eliminate this guy, I have to introduce new factor, new factor that grows very quickly. So if you remember, we had this problem that you just remove the first row, that guy is going to be gigantic. So of course you can do variable elimination, but you're not going to gain any uh, computation advantage. So. Again, this is also the slide that I showed you before. We, in, in the previous lectures, we focus on this part, exact inference, but I ignore uh, the computational cost. So today's lecture is going to be about this part. And uh, basically, this module that we started today is going to be mostly about the techniques um, that we do for uh, approximate inference. Um, if you ask me, of course, like uh, uh, nothing against what we talked in, in the previous slides, but I, I think the research part of the, the graphical model starts here that like, these are the realities that we face uh, in, 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 a, in a daily basis. And so much of the focus in, uh, on, on research right now is that how can we run an algorithm that either runs faster, produce a better estimator, are closer to, to quote unquote ground truth. So, so there are lots of research going on. Overall, uh, for approximate inference, there are two approaches. And we are going to talk about these two approaches two, uh, uh, in, a, in the following uh, lectures. So this week, I'm going to talk about variational algorithm, uh, loop belief propagation, and mean field approach. But overall, there are two classes of algorithm. One class of algorithm that are uh, using optimization, and another set of algorithms that use uh, sampling approach. Historically speaking, uh, sampling approach uh, are way more popular, was way more popular, and has been way more popular in statistic, and variational algorithms were mostly used in machine learning. Um, there are several reasons for that. So one of the reasons that variational algorithm was more popular in, in um, machine learning uh, method was that in so many cases, uh, in machine learning, we focus on prediction. And um, we sometimes put the, the estimation of the uncertainty under the rock. So if we get an algorithm that produced good result, but uh, overconfidence about the result, we are fine with it, which might not be good for all applications. Hence, we are fine with the, with the variational uh, method that it scales much better than uh, MCMC and uh, sampling approach. Sampling approach, on the other hand, is co are considered uh, this, uh, the, you know, the best we can possibly achieve with a very high computational cost. I have to say that there are efforts to combine these two with each other. So have hybrid method that is a mixture of optimization approach and sampling approach. And we'll talk about this at the end of this module, uh, the sampling approach that uses the structure of, uh, use basically gradient. Uh, um, and also there has been some research recently on how to make the sampling based inference uh, more scalable. But overall there are tons of research going on in this field. Also, because, uh, because nowadays we are combining graphical models with deep learning, so we are basically leaving some of our comfort zone in terms of like no, many of the things that we use these days are not exponential families, so there are more challenges, but at the same time means that there are more interesting research going on. Yes? So when you say sampling, do you mean sampling a completely empty data set and then sampling 
distribution or all the variables or, huh. or sampling? I'll talk about the sampling approach uh, after the spring break, but let me give you a teaser. So when I say sampling approach, I'll talk about deep sampling and MCMC. So when I say sampling approach, that's what I mean. Um, so what we sample there, so we sample basically, let's say that you want to compute one of those inference queries. So you want to compute for certain probability of one of random values given the data. So for example, in the Gibbs sampling, we start, we start substituting the variables of unknown random variables with something that we believe that's coming from the, the, the real posterior. It's not the real posterior because we haven't converged, but basically the general idea is that you sample from a distribution, you evolve that distribution, you sample again. So you, sample, you basically feed in uh, the unknown random variables with, with what you believe, what you believe that is, a, is, a, is an approximation of the posterior. And you evolve that posterior until on the convergence, you, well, theoretically you go to the, to the, to the real posterior. So, so that's basically the general idea on the you know, like a view from Mars. So um, the problem with that is that um, at least the vanilla version of that is expensive. Unless you do the more um, fancier approach to parallelize your algorithm, um, you use the structure of the gradient, those are expensive. But those are great algorithms. So if you, if for whatever problem that you're solving, for example, you care about, like, I want to know the variable, I, I, I want to know the, uh, the, the approximate mean and variance of this variable, I would say that we still have issues on, on variation of algorithm. But like, I'm jumping ahead. We'll talk about it. OK, so let's recap of the belief propagation for one million times. So hopefully you remember the form of the message that you pass through um, the, uh, the method. So here I'm removing the factors graph. I'm viewing that these are the nodes that they are sending messages to each other. The form of the message that goes from node K to the node I was, was basically like this. That, so let's say that um, so the form of message was, was as follows. That if, uh, so this is the interaction term between variable I and variable J. This is, so this is the, the binary term. This is the unary term. So this is the, the, the term that involves the interaction between variable mm -hmm. I's and variable J. And this is the, uh, the, the contribution of variable I's. And when you want to send a message from uh, I to J, so what you do here is that you receive all of the messages from the rest of them, and you apply the unary and interaction term, and this was the form of the message. So basically, this summarize this term summarize the evidence from the rest of the random variables. Okay, so I put so many circles down here. So these terms is the interaction term between random variables and so on and so forth. And at the end, we have some scheduling mechanism that you send all of the messages, you receive all of the messages back, and for each node, when all of the messages has arrived, you multiply them with each other, and you have a belief, which was proportional to your mar uh, to marginal distribution. That was basically the algorithm that we did using message, message passing. So we have this term message and belief that, so the belief of the, uh, of the variable i was multiplication of all of the messages it has received from its neighbors, multiplied by, by its own belief, by, by its own contribution, by psi i, and that was the form of the belief. So I, I think I mentioned this message passing in a different form, just like giving you different forms of saying exactly the same thing in order to make sure that you are not, uh, you are familiar, you, when you see that in the literature, you are familiar with it. So what was the form of the messages? So we had, if you convert your graph to factor graph, we had two kinds of messages. The, the, the message that goes from a node to a factor and factor to a node. And we had the belief of the factor, and we had the belief of a node, right? OK. So the message that goes from node i to factor a had, this, had the following form. So basically, the algorithm goes like this. If I'm a node, and I want to send a message to a factor, 
I have to receive, I have to multiply all of the messages that I receive from all of the other nodes, except the, the guy that I'm sending message to, multiply them and send it. That was the algorithm. Just, if you want to write the code, it's just two lines. So, and the belief, what is the belief? The belief is that when all of the messages are sent, and I receive all of the messages, the belief that I form is that I multiply all of the, the messages that I receive from the factors, because remember, in a factor graph, is a bipartite graph. One side is the factors, one side is the node. So I don't receive the node, the, the, uh, the message from uh, the, the node, right? So I multiply them with each other, that's my belief. And I normalize it, and that's, that becomes what? If I normalize my belief after I multiply all of the incoming messages, what, what do I get? Say it again? Yes, exactly, marginal probabilities. And similarly for the factors, right? The algorithm, if you want to write the code, for the, the message that, for the message passing algorithm for the factors, if, I, if I'm a factor, I want to send a message to a node, what do I get? What, what do I do? I collect all of the messages from the other node, multiply them, apply my own operation, which was here, and send it. And sum over the rest of the variable and send it. And, right? All of the other nodes, apply my operation, sum over all of the rest of the random variables, and send it. And similar, so the form of my belief as a factor is the same thing. When I receive all of the messages at the end of the message passing, I multiply them with each, uh, with each other, apply my own operation, and that's my belief. So if I normalize this, what do I get? Join, join marginals, exactly. So this was marginal of, if I normalize this guy, I get the marginal of that random variables. If I marginal this guy, I'm gonna get marginal of whatever that is inside of it. That's it. Okay, so it, it was intentional that I put it, I put the message passing in the factor graph, oh, and this one, right? It's just the same thing. Sometimes we use, we just like, skip the, 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 the representing my random uh, graph on model in the factor graph. Sometimes I just don't, but it depends on the context. I just want you to see both of these forms. They're exactly the same thing. Okay, clear? All right. All right, and then that was the operation that we, we do on, a, on the factors, operation that we do on a, on a nodes, and then we have some sort of a scheduling procedure that, if, for example, if I have a graph, if I have a tree, I start sending messages, so I use one of the nodes as a root, I start sending messages down till like, they, they arrive at the root, and they send the message back, and that's, that's basically my schedule procedure. So I send all of the messages, or I can do other way around, I can do all, send all of the messages from the root, they all arrive at the node, and then when the node, so node, node's not gonna send the message any to anywhere else. So it has received all of the other messages, so it can send the message back, and then you provide it. So, okay, so these are all the recap of uh, what we said last time. So now the question is that, what if there is a loop? And what should we do? So here's an example, very simple example. The previous one was a, a tree structure. There's no looping. But let's say that if I have a loop, well, what should I do? Um, and you guys hopefully remember that what would happen if we have a loop, if we, uh, worst case scenario. So worst case scenario is that you send it, so there's no scheduling, right? Because like, you can send a message, there's no, you cannot assign anybody as a, as a root, it's not a tree. You can send a message, and that guy may receive a message again and again and result in consistency. But let's say that um, even if I have a loop, I come up with, with a, let's say that I have a problem to solve and I have a loopy graph and the only algorithm that I know is the message passing. I may say that, let's just run it. Let's just run the message passing. Hopefully it will converge. So basically, loopy belief propagation is exactly that. We have a procedure for sending messages. 
We run it anyway. We know that in a worst case scenario, it may not converge, but it's a worst case scenario. What if my problem is not the worst case scenario? Maybe it converges, maybe it doesn't. So today's lecture is about when, it, so, well, I, I'm not gonna talk about when it works, but I, I'm just gonna say that what this procedure would be equivalent to in terms of optimization. So the general idea is this. I have a procedure which is message passing. I'm gonna run it in spite of having a loop. And this is loopy belief propagation. So you can view this as a fixed point operation. Hopefully you guys remember the fixed point operation that you remember that we have, you want to solve fx equal to x, you want to find the x. You just put the x, you, uh, you put the x inside of f and then you operate again and again and hopefully at the convergence fx equal to x. So this is basically what we believe propagation is, 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 is a kind of doing that. So we'll analyze it in more detail in the following uh, slides. So, um, so operation is exactly the same. So the, this kind of, so belief of the nodes or multiplication of all of the incoming messages. Belief of the, the factors, in, uh, multiplication of the, all of the incoming messages. And the message passing is exactly the same. So the problem is that, as I mentioned in, a, in, a, in one of the lectures, in, uh, in lecture six, I said that worst case scenario, it may not come. But in practice, it actually converged most of the time. And what this is, at least in 90s, there has been, um, in late 90, uh, 1990s, there was a lot of problems in computer vision that people cast it as an as a inference over the, the graph from, uh, over MRF. And graduate students said that, well, I, ha I have a deadline. I have to run it. I'm just going to run it and say that I run it. Uh, I, 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 I ran a message passing algorithm, and it works, and the result is good. So for a while, people have been doing this, and at some point, people realize that wait a minute, there is something behind the scene going on. Although that we know that the worst case scenario may not converge, but people are using it, and it works pretty well. So what is going on? So is it just a hack? If it is a hack, it's a sort of interesting hack because in practice it's very effective. So how, how, does, how does it actually work? So the scheduling that works in loopy, loopy belief propagation, the way that practitioners back in uh, late 90s were using loopy belief propagation was something like this. So, so they, they come up with some uh, heuristics. So one of the heuristics would be, well, I'm gonna do some, um, um, ordering between nodes, and I have the operation for the incoming messages and outgoing messages. And I'm going to run this algorithm, for example, until the, the, the estimate of the belief that I have doesn't change much. Another way of doing that, another way of running this escaping was that, like, I'm going to run it for, I don't know, 1,000 iterations. So this was the very heuristic approach that people were using, and it was working. So then back in uh, late 99, um, some researchers, uh, Kevin Morphy and uh, Yara Weiss uh, and Michael Jordan, um, realized that there is something actually uh, behind the scene that like, although it's a heuristic, there is a reason for this heuristic uh, that works. So then they thought that, okay, so maybe we have to dive into more detail that is it just a hack that we are lucky that it works or there is a reason, there is a, there is a cost function that this heuristic is optimized. And a, I'm gonna show you what kind of cost function this heuristic is actually optimized. And that's very interesting. So, um, so what do we want to estimate at the end? So let's say at the end, we are, we are interested in estimating a posterior. So for example, so x, set of random variables, let's say A is represent the set um, of that random variables given all of the data. So we are, we are interested in estimating this. All of these approximation algorithm, at the end, what they are doing is that they, they say that, let me find another distribution. This is an approximate distribution. So that these two guys are very close to each other. So this is at the core of all of this approximation algorithm. 
But then, if you want to talk about closeness and closeness of two distribution, you should have a measure of how close they are. Because if you don't have a closeness, I just say that what was the what was the answer to all of the question? Was seventy two or was forty two? So forty two divided just like forty two and then normalize all of them. It's gonna be beautiful. So well, how, how can you say that my approximation is better than your approximation? You need to have a measure of how close your approximation is to, two, to, to, to the true random variables. So one very natural way of approximating uh, the distance between distribution is KL divergence. Hopefully you guys remember the KL divergence. So let's say that if my uh, distribution, I'm just, let's say, if I, uh, X is a set of all of the random variable, variables that I have. And I, I'm going to represent it as a Gibbs distribution. Well, in the in MRF, in the in uh, UGM. So, a measure of, so one way of measuring the distance between distribution is, is the KL divergence. And for discrete random variables, I can write it as follows. So, there are some interesting, uh, so KL has some interesting properties. One of the, the properties that well, it's always, uh, is, it, it can never become negative, but it's not symmetric. So if I switch, it, it should, you should see that like, there is no symmetry. If I change the Q1 and Q2, this, this uh, KL value changes. And so it's, a, it's some sort of like a divergence between distribution, but it's not a distance, right? What would happen, so now, let's, let's do this. So can I do something like this, Q1 and Q2 as a KL between Q1, Q2, Q2, Q1. So I'm gonna define a new distance, uh, and I symmetrize the, the KL. Right? I sum the KL of Q1, Q2, and Q2, Q1. This is always non-negative, right? Because each of the elements are non-negative. And it's symmetric now, right? You agree this is D is symmetric. But is D a distance? What do I need for a distance? For, if I de define a function, a function of two pairs of uh, point in a... In a Yes. Does it have a does it follow does it satisfy the triangular property? So what is a triangular property? So the distance between Q1 and Q2 should be less than Q1 plus QT or Q Q1 Q2 plus Right? This is the triangle. Okay. <coughs> it turned out that KL does not satisfy, so even symmetrized version of that does not satisfy uh, triangle property. So it's not a real distance. Nevertheless, this is very useful because of the some interesting properties that KL has. So what are the interesting properties? So it's not negative. If, if you set the Q1, Q2 becomes zero, okay, that's, that's fine. But it's not symmetric. Even if you symmetrize it, it doesn't satisfy the triangular inequality, so it won't become a real distance. But we're going to use it anyway. Uh, what is it? When? Yeah. Uh, so you can prove that it, it, it fails. So it's not when, it's just like by default doesn't satisfy triangular inequality. You can show that, you can give an example, you can come up with an example that doesn't make the triangular property happen. So, um, um, so one question is why do we choose KL divergence to compare? Why can't we do something like a KL statistic, which is like there are yeah, that's a good, that's a really good point. So why not using a, the real distance between probes? You can use Hellinger distance, right? Or there are several distances that are actually distance symmetric, not negative. So one of the reasons is that the form of the KL divergence in a, is in a way that makes some of uh, our calculation easy. Um, so so and, and this, is, this is basically, this slide is about that. So why KL? 
So why not just using something that is behaving better? So the, the, the cool things about the form of triangular inequality is like if I expand the KL divergence, I can basically expand this line as, as this, right? The, 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 the log of the denominator versus the log of the denominator, right? right? And I can write each of those as an expectation. So I can write this as, as expectation of what? So what is, how can I write this as an expectation, the first step? Can I write this as an expectation? What? Log of Q. Yes. It's log of the Q. And what is this? I mean, this is the, the expectation of the first step. I didn't have a space to write the second one. But what is this one? Entropy. Negative entropy. Negative entropy. So this is the negative entropy. And we know a lot about the entropy. We know the behavior of entropy. Um, so what is the distribution that, ha that, okay, so when we are increasing the entropy, what does it mean intuitively? Yeah, exactly. You're just like increasing more randomness, right? And the second one can you can also write as an as an expectation, right? What is the, how can I write this guy as an expectation? The same thing that we do. Expectation from of log p of x. Right. So the reason I like this writing everything as an expectation because if I have an expectation, I have a very natural way to estimate. I just sample from the, the things that I'm making expectation with respect to, plug that in, average it, my estimate. It might be bad estimate, but it's an estimate. So we have a way to write it as an expectation. We love everything that looks like an expectation. So if you use something else, you may not have this advantage that everything looks like an expectation. expectation. Anyway, so the KL looks like some expectation of the px and an entropy. So if I want to write it for a Gibbs uh, distribution for, uh, for the, a general UGM, it's going to look like an entropy, the first term, and expectation of the, the px. Remember the px I had at the following form. So if I expand it, I'm going to have log partition function. So this was the partition function, right? And this is the log partition function. Entropy of the Q and entropy of the factors. These are the factors, right? Expectation of the factors. And we will use this all the time. So now, um, so let's focus on a, on a, on a graph that is a UGM. So I have a log of the factors log partition function, and entropy of the Q. So this operation is called free energy. So it's a, it's a, it's a sum of the negative entropy and an expectation of a term that involves uh, uh, factors. So we want to minimize it or we want to maximize it. I'll get back. We want to so minimize. minimize. So we are minimizing the KL. So let's say that you have a query which is PX that you want to ask a question, and you want to find another distribution that are as close to that. Right? So, so what are the properties of this cost function? What is the if I substitute P into this, what do I get? Right? And then if it is always bounded. So, okay, how can I show that, th is this true or not, and why is it true? Fp and P are zero, right? And Fp and Q, I want to show it is like always, but you want, okay, so you have a cost function that you know that the, the lowest value is zero, right? I argue that this is always true for any other. So for if you fix p and you change q, your value is always bigger than f p p, which is zero. By the way, That's why is that? Z is always larger than greater or equal to one. So and q l is the reason is that 
your uh, so yeah if you, if you said uh, so if, if log z is always um, positive mm -hmm. Log QP is always non negative, right? Anyway. Okay, so what I want to say is that this cost function has some interesting properties that is always lower bounded. When you set P and Q to, to equality, the value of that cost function, because KL is the best that you can possibly achieve, is zero, right? You can go negative, right? So when you make uh, when these two values are the, sa are the same, basically, if Q become P, this value become what? This negative of this value, right? Because they have to cancel out. So you know the lower bound for this when you're minimizing. So why not? So now the question is that what well, seems that is a good cost function? So what if um, I want to find P? I cannot compute P. I come up with another distribution, Q, and I always have to uh, find this cost function, right? A cost function that looks like the expectation of the factors plus an entropy. Now, the question is that the first time is actually not that hard to compute because most of the time, if you remember in UGN, the log of our factors were look like something like first order or second order. And it's just a matter of, if you have a queue that you know the, the expectation of the first order or second order, you're fine. But the entropy is not always easy. Unless your queue is simple, you don't know how the entropy, what's a closed form for entropy. So all of this algorithm about approximate inference focus on how we can come up with the family of the queue that we know the entropy so that we can substitute something close form here. And we can estimate the F. Right? So the estimating F has two components, entropy and estimating the second term. So if you come up with another approx a family of the distribution, a parameterization, that you can compute the orders, the first order or second order function that shows up here, and come up with, with a way that compute the entropy, you're good. So the rest of approximate inference algorithms that are using optimization are finding a family that is behaving well and we know the, the parameterization and estimating this value. Yes, you had a question. Yeah, um, what, what, uh, can you give an intuition why that's called free energy? Ah, uh, yeah. So this idea of uh, um, free energy is coming from physics. So, um, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more uh, in the following is, uh, slides, but so back in physics, they wanted to compute, so they have, let's say that they had the lattice of, of the atoms, and they wanted to compute whether that's a stable or not, and what is, it, what is the energy? Is it to compute the stability of the, is it, what is the energy of this lattice? So you can think of a lattice, a 3D lattice, as a 3D Markov random field. The problem was that they couldn't compute this in a closed form, and they come up with an approximation to compute the energy of that lattice. Actually, this work that I'm going to present in the following slides in physics got a Nobel Prize. And so I don't know the, well, definitely, she didn't get a Nobel Prize for this. But uh, this idea was in, was in physics. So I don't know people come up with an algorithm knowing the physics or later on see the connection between physics. But definitely it has a connection. Um, but definitely it was invented in physics before. So anyway, so talking about the free energy, basically the general idea is that in, so we change the inference algorithm to an optimization algorithm and minimizing, so we come up with an energy that we want to minimize. That's the general idea. So let's work out a simple case. So let's say that, uh, hopefully you guys remember this slide. So let's say that if I have a choral graph of four random variables, um, so I can, I can write this as, as multiplication of this factor and this factor with a normalizer. 
But this also has some interesting properties. You guys remember the other properties of this graph? When the graph is chordal, remember that they can write it as marg some sort of the marginals. You guys remember that? <clears throat> junction Exactly. So can I can you uh, help me write that? So the, the mark what A B C uh, times B C D over B C. Uh huh. Uh, okay. So and then so so multiply. Okay. So it's basically is this. So multiplication of the marginals of P A B C. P exactly as you said the P C D divided by the intersection. Right. That was I said that if the graph is chordal. I can write this as a, as, a, as a probability. The nice thing about this is that this was potential, right? But these are probably the marginal probabilities. So these are normalized. And um, what is the factor, the, the, the factor graph representation of that? So it's basically the general idea is coming from that. So if I have um, a chain, let's say, for example, a chain of eight random variables, yes. Uh, eight random variables. So, I mean, very obviously, I can write it as a factor graph. It's like factors between four and three, three and two, two and one, and so on and so forth. But can I use the? Can I write this as a, as a marginals? Can I write this as a marginal? Can I write it as, oops, px3x4 x px2x3, x so this guy, this guy, this guy, right, and so on and so forth. And then what should I divide it by? Those one, two, three. Exactly. So I have to divide it by this, 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 but not four and seven, right? Not, not these two, because these are not in, in the intersection. I, I ended up counting some other variable twice, so I have to divide it by x3, x2, yeah, right? Okay. That's another way of writing this. Now, we are interested in computing this free energy. Right? So, and let's say that this is the form of the function that I have. So my entropy looks like, so remember that I have to compute the entropy of this P. So my entropy become entropy of my nominator minus the entropy of the de denominator, right? That's how the form of the, the graph will look like. Make sense? I, rep I can represent it as a, as a factor. So this A is going to be pairwise factor. It's going to be here. This is A1, A2, and so on, right? So this is the form of my entropy. And similarly for F, right? So for, for my F, yes. Those are not going to be entropy. They're just going to be expectations, right? Those but the entropy is an expectation. Why your entropy? Because then you should then the expectation needs to be exactly on the. Expectation. Yes, so that's what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm taking expectation with respect to P. Oh, okay. Okay. So. But I want to say that this entropy, because of these chordal properties, breaks out, like the nominators and the denominators. And similarly for f, right? My f become, my cost function become the, 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 the ratio. So basically at the end, my cost function become p's and f's. It's like it has the, exactly the same properties as my f. So maybe. Um, one easier to think about it is 
P is what, so F is given, right? F is something that you want to compute the approximation with respect to. P is your approximate distribution. So now you are assuming that, let's assume that my, uh, my distribution that I want to so use on an approximation has some sort of like a funny chain properties. Then if it's a chain properties, it follows this equation that all of the pairwise and all of the, the unaries that are shared, it does going to be the form of my distribution. And because this is the form of the distribution, if I take expectation with respect to this, it's going to be expectation, expectation of log with respect to this. It's like a log of the nominator, which is this term, and the minus the log of the denominator, the minus this term. So on a nominator, I'm going to say, get all of the pairs. And on a denominator, I'm going to get all of the shared terms. This is for simple chain. And similarly, if I apply that, so this is for the, the edge term, right? For the edge term. If I apply this the same on the F, it's going to have the same form. Okay. So now, what about for a general tree? So let's say that if I have a general tree, the graph that looks like this, as a tree, so I'm going to get all of the pairwise term. And the, 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 the share term, right? So how does the, the form should look like? Let's say I have a, have a, have a general graph, general tree. So I'm going to get the function that my p x1 through all of, all of them xn. On a nominator, I'm going to get uh, multiplication of the pairs pairs and all of the the unary term that are shared how does the the form of function will look like so if i have a node that are shared between multiple nodes it's going to get a degree of that right so it's going to get a degree of that so so you so these term, for example, this let's call this x3. X3 is gonna show up in a denominator once, twice, and three times, not four times. Right? Like basically it's gonna be degree minus one. Because like the, the, the terms that are at the at the end gonna get they are not gonna get repeated again, right? The, the degree of these terms are one, right? So you won't see them again. So the one that are shared are just going to see that. So for a general graph, the way it looks like is as follows. You can write, the, write it as a problem. So for a general tree, uh, general tree, you can write it as multiplication of the factors, which is your nominator, and, and the denominator. So this is your nominator, this is your nominator, and this is your denominator. Make sense? Okay, so if I compute the probability of that, the entropy will look like set of the interaction terms and set of the, the binding unary terms that are in the intersection multiplied by their degree. This is for general three, and this is what the D is coming from. And similar, similarly for F. So this is the case for a general tree. So for, for example, for the for form of the, the function that we have here, we're going to get the, so my free energy function is going to look like a function that is function of 1 and 2, 2 and 3, 6 and 4, and then the set of interaction terms that shows up here. So positive, so you have, when you want to minimize this, you, have, you end up with a set of interaction term minus the set of the terms that are shared across them. Right? But that's how it looks like for a simple chain. Now, how can we extend it to a general graph? So the general idea was that, well, if that's a procedure to, to build this cost function, 
And all you need is to know the, the, the degree of the node. You are just not applying that. And that's your cost function. So the general idea is that, well, you, so we want to compute the free energy between approximate distribution of what we want, P. But it's hard to compute. There's, it's loopy. I don't know how to compute expectation. But I have a procedure to do something, to compute something which is F hat that follows the same procedure. The same procedure is for all of the terms. So even if you have a loopy graph, I'm going to do something like this. So I'm going to say, what if, if I just count, so I say that these are the, these are the interaction terms. So for entropy, I'm just going to use entropy of x1, 2, entropy of x1, 3, and so on and so forth. And then for x2, I'm just going to count the number of degrees of this and say that, well, what is the degree of this? It's just 3, so I'm going to say 2 minus 2 of entropy of x2 and minus 2 of the entropy of x3. That's the way I just build my code. I just follow the same recipe. So following the same recipe, we will arrive at what is called Beth. Uh, approximation or Beth energy. And that is what I, what I was telling you that got the uh, Nobel Prize in Physics for estimating free energy. Of course, they did way more like this. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, not. So, so that basically for a, 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 a graph that has a loop, uh, for example, this one. So remember, our original one didn't have these guys, right? Didn't have this. So all I do is that. I'm going to get all of the binary terms, x3 and x4, x, x3 and x2, and so on and so forth, and just subtract the degree of the shared term. Remember, for the chain, you had minus f2. Now you have 2, 2 f2 and 2 f6. And that's my energy. So and instead of solving f, which was hard, I'm going to solve f hat, which I build like this. So this sounds a little bit ad hoc, that you just follow the recipe to build a cost function. You're minimizing a, a, a cost function. How do you know this f hat that you are optimizing has anything to do with the f that you wanted to optimize? I wanted to optimize f. I wasn't able to do that. I come up with another cost function. I'm optimizing that one. So what is the relationship between these two? So this method has a bunch of uh, pros and cons. So the pros is that it's easy to optimize. Because all I need is to write it as a cost function and optimize it. The, the, the bad things about it is that I'm not sure. We don't know the relationship between f and f hat. For example, we don't know that whenever we are optimizing f hat, which is the, I, basically I pretended that the graph is a tree. Even the loopy graph is a tree, and I just like follow the same procedure. I pretend it. So we don't know the relationship between f hat and f. The f hat being f uh, beth energy. We don't know it's always lower than the actual f. We don't know it's always higher than that. And but we know that it's easy to optimize because it has a, cl a closed form and like it has a, has a nice behavior. <clears throat> so now, all we need to do is that if I can write the, the optimization, pro my optimization problem as uh, the same procedure I told you, all I need to optimize was this marginal. Unary mar marginals and the binary marginal. And this is my knobs that I, I can optimize. So back in um, late 90s, some people thought that, well, this is interesting. So although it's, it's a, it sounds like a, you know ad hoc cost function, and we don't know the relationship between this ad hoc cost function and the real cost function, but it works in reality. But you guys probably have realized that I've been talking about loopy 
message passing, and now I'm going to give you a cost function. How does these two relate to each other? So loopy belief propagation, and this is some sort of a cost function. Are they related? And that was the beauty of what they, uh, uh, some researchers in MIT uh, was that they realized that these are related. So how are those related? So I'm going to show you how these two problems are related to each other. So let's work out some, uh, so um, if I have a factor graph, if I have a factor graph, let's say for simplicity for, uh, for the discrete random variables, so let's say that all of these x's in the bottom, these are the factors, right? All of those are discrete. Now, all I, so an f is given and b is not. So because the, it's a pairwise marginal, is, 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 is either pairwise marginal or the marginals of the factor. So this doesn't, so if you represent as a factor, it doesn't have to be paired, it can be uh, triple. So I don't know b's, but if it's discrete, my bees look like what? My bees are marginals, right? So how does it, how does the bee, this belief look like? If it is discrete, if these guys are discrete, how does the bees look like? So let's say that this is binary. This is it takes zero one. This is zero one. How does this guy look like? It's yeah, it's a table, right? Just a table. Right? So this is going to be a bunch of, I mean, it depends on if, if xA is 2, it's going to be table, it's going to be 3, it's going to be tensor, and so on and so forth. But, but it has a nice form. So what kind of properties it should have? Now that I know it's marginal, what kind of properties it should have? It's a table, but like... It should be between 0 and 1. It should be between 0 and 1, and? All the rows should sum up to 1. No, all of the, it's not conditional, it's marginal. So all of the elements should sum to 1. No, I didn't. So I said this is an extension of that, right? So if you remember, for undirected graph, I had a bunch of pairwise uh, connection. I can do the same thing for factor graph, right? For factor graph, so in this example that I, I, I told you, the factors were between these these guys, right? Factors were here. And these are factors. I can write write it in the same way for factors, right? So this is this is a a tree is the factors that the degree of each of the factor nodes is each of those are connected, right? So the, each of these this simple graph that I show you was for example, but the degree of this is two, right? Factors interact with, with, with two neighbors as, a, as an edge. But I can represent it for any factor graph. I can do the same procedure. So in the loopy case, we this you you we're doing this product with this Markov matrix infinite number of times. So one can say that Markov matrix? So this marginal this this tensor would be a Markov matrix. This uh, not going to be Markov matrix because it sums. So Markov matrix sums. It depends on how you represent. It's column sum or row sum to one. This is marginals, right? If it's a marginal, it's like let's say that this factor is a is pre pretend that it's only two nodes coming in, right? So this is going to be a matrix of four elements, right? So because marginal of two random variables, it should sum to one, right? Okay. So now. I come up with an en energy using the best uh, energy trick, which basically I pretend that the graph is not loopy, it's a tree. I have all of the, the pairwise connection through a factors, and all of the shared term that are subtracted. Now, all the, the unit of my optimization are these, these terms. For unary terms, it's going to be a vector that sums to 1. For a factor, it's going to be a vector or tensor or whatever, depends on the degree of that, that sums to 1. And this is all I need to optimize. Yes. So but with some constant. Okay. I don't understand. So A is now like uh, going over the factor? Yes. OK, and XIs are going to be the? On the variable. Yeah, but which ones? 
these are x's, right? These are x's. These are x1, x1, x2, and xn. Right? But my b's are now normalized marginals. Marginals over the random variables that are connected to that variable. So it has a form that looks like the denominator, that the denominators are factors minus one minus degree of the denominators, the marginals of the units. Right? It's basically extension of that idea for a factor graph. But now, you're what you want to optimize is these Bs and BAs. So, X A's implement all the random variables which belong to factor, factor A. Factor A, exactly. So, this is basically a generalization of the pairwise. Exactly, it's just generalization of that. Yeah, exactly. So, I gave you an example for the, for the binary because it's easier to visualize, but you can easily write it for a factor graph. So if you have a factor graph of three random variables, just a, x a is going to be three, right? X one, two, three. That's the same thing. But the way that I write this cost function was going through like writing my graph and counting the degree of the random variables to get the di's, then just that. Right. Okay. Now yes. And B a is the marginal over x a. B I this guy. BA. B A on the left side. This? Yeah. This is the this is writing that so let's let's call this guy A. Right? Okay. So there are three random variables coming in. So it's a factor of three random variables. For for simplicity to assume that's binary. So B A is gonna be how many elements gonna have? Eight. Eight. And they're all summed to one. It's Some marginal. It's a marginal. Yeah, it's not a fact. Okay. Yeah, that's right. yeah. So, but you want what you want to optimize is this BA. You don't know this. You don't know these BAs, and you don't know these BIs. And you want to minimize this cost function. So, what are the subject to constants? So, what are the constants I have to write? I just told you. So the, then, my knobs are these BAs. Gonna sum up to one. So, one of the constants is going to be BI. Xi over Xi is going to be 1. What else? Fine. And also for BAs, right? OK, I'm going to write it on the top because there's no space. OK, what else? There's still one thing missing. BAs are marginals, right? BA set of random variables. Let's say that for simplicity A, let's say A is 1, 2. This is the marginal of the joint distribution 1 and 2. What else I should add to this? So if I have B, which is the marginal property of x1 and x2, what would happen if I do sum over bx1? What do I get? bx2, right? But you, you might have bx2 as an optimization one, right? So these are consistent, consistency terms. So you have to make sure that these are satisfied, right? So you need to add those terms here. So you have to make sure that if you are summing over bxi and you are summing all of the a's, let's say minus j, this should be equal to bxj. These are the cost function. This, sorry, constraint. Now, these are the consistency constraint. So, so now I have a uniform uh, optimization problem that this is my cost function with a bunch of constraint that I have. So what is the recipe to, to solve it? When you have a cost function with constraint, what do you do? You do Lagrangian, right? So now we are going to introduce some Lagrangian. Lagrangian for the unary terms, Lagrangian for, uh, well, the unary terms and all of the um, 
the, 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 the factors, and also all of the consistencies. So these are the Lagrangian. This is Lagrangian and this is Lagrangian. I just didn't introduce, I just pretend that all of them are positive, but because that's easy to enforce. Positive is easy to enforce. So I, I, can, I can say that bi's is x of something else, and then I'll find it under TT, right? That's easy. And then, so let's say, I don't know, call that uh, h. No, h is that. So no. u, right? Then u is unconstrained. And then optimize, I, I can optimize with respect to u. So this is why I skipped the, the, the non-negative. So what we do is that make a derivative and set it to 0. Now, the interesting thing is that when you set the derivative in, 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 and set it to 0, the messages look like this. The bi's look like 1 over di's multiplication of the, all of the Lagrangian, sum over all of the nodes are coming to i, and the marginals looks like the energy minus the Lagrangian of the pairwise. The beauty of what um, Weiss uh, uh, observed back then was that they saw the connection between the form of the BIs and a message passing. Yes? I remember I wanted BI to be non-negative, right? You just did that, so yeah. I thought you were, that was a suggestion. Yeah, no, well, I didn't show it. <laughs> so if you set it to zero, okay, so what are you saying? Okay, so now the beauty of that is they identify, they, they make this leap of faith, although it's not really leap of faith, that what if, if I form, if I is write the Lagrangian as a message? What would happen if I write so the Lagrangian as a log message? Remember that this lambda i's, are the equality constraint. So this Lagrangian can be positive, can be negative. If I substitute, if I substitute uh, the Lagrangian as a log of the messages, what I get is, is the message passing algorithm. And that was the beauty of that algorithm, that the, the beauty of this observation, that basically what loopy belief propagation does is that first it pretends that the loopy graph is a tree where the, no, the, uh, the degree of the nodes are the degree of the, the nodes in, the, in the, your loopy graph, number one. They form the optimization problem as a, as a pair of the marginals that make, makes the form, uh, the best energy. The right is the Lagrangian, and your Lagrangian are doing message passing. And that was the connection. So when you actually solve this problem, when you actually solve this, um, you see that the form of the belief of, of of the BIs look like this, which is exactly the form of the belief in message passing. And that was the, 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 a proof that although the loopy belief propagation looks like a hack, in fact, is, is optimizing Beth energy. So it's not ad hoc after all. That, that, that ad hoc after all. So, so yeah, anyway, so at the end, what we get is that instead of, well, you can use, uh, solve um, a bet energy, or you can do loopy belief propagation, they're do, both doing the same thing. So, so far, as I said, the summary is as follows. So if you have a graph, this is loopy, you can first come up, count the, the degree of the, each of the nodes. So you have DIs for each of the nodes. Convert it to the factor graph. Find the actual free energy that you want to optimize. Well, you cannot optimize it. You replace it with the Beth energy, which is basically going to be a denominator, which is your factors, and denominator, which is going to contribute with the de their degrees. And your belief for the pair elements and uh, unary elements is going to be a belief for it. So what is the theory behind this? Um, so we don't have time to go too much deep into the, the theory of that. But um, so it's basically, this is, so 
there's a so so this is basically a variant of the variational algorithm. What do I call it as a variational algorithm? Is that so I view the the family. So instead of having explicit form, so remember that you want to optimize q p f of q p, and this q belongs to some family, right? So one way to do that, and I said that like. Well, we don't know how to introduce entropy. I don't know how to compute the entropy for a general Q. So I cannot make a derivative, although I cannot make a derivative with respect to Q because, I mean, first of all, it means optimization over the infinite, uh, so infinite dimensional function because Qs are functions, distributions. So, uh, so basically, LBP, LBP approach is as follows. So they said that, okay, so this is hard. I'm going to focus on a distribution that I can uh, formulate their marginals. I'm going to optimize that. I'm not going to go after Q directly. I'm going to go after its marginals. And what I'm optimizing is a bet energy which pretends that the graph is a tree. So, and I have to say that. Um, Loopy repropagation, or another way of saying that optimizing the bet and uh, uh, bet cost function is a way to solving this variational optimization. Here, by variational optimization, I'm talking about optimizing this cost function. In the next class, I'm going to tell you another way to optimize this cost function. So the general idea that you saw in, in the previous slide was that Instead of going after the entire Q, we went after marginals, which was pairwise marginals. Oh, sorry, like unary marginals or pairwise marginals, if the, the factors are order two. I mean, you can extend this to more than that, but it's easier for me to write. And we basically write, we relax our, our, our class, we relax our family of distribution where we are searching with the family of the, with the family of the distribution that their, their pairwise and unaries can be, can be formulated in an easy way. So if you think of the, the discrete random variables, so let's say that if you have um, a set of n random variables that are all discrete. So if my x is x1 through xn, so defining a distribution over this space, so let's say that I want to define distribution over all of the possibilities that I can define over x i and x, x, x j. So this, so and just for simplicity, let's say that x i's are taking binary random variables. So the set of the probability distribution over the entire uh, discrete random variables is p i over p n, and they they sum to one. So for a discrete random, and I can extend this. I can extend this. So let's say that this is 0, 1. This is a simple case. Um, for a discrete random, a discrete distribution, it can be shown that the, the, the space of probability distribution is set of set of linear equations that are all intersect with each other. And when you have set of linear equalities, in, in, linear inequalities, the resulting feasible set become a polyhedron. A polyhedron that, like, so, so if I have a x bigger than b, so the a x bigger than b look like this in a space, because it's going to be a x, be a one, a n x, and it's going to be a x one. A, a x1 non negative, a2 x1 non negative, and so on and so forth. And it looks like a space of the function. So if you, it can be shown that if you have a discrete set of random variables, you can write this feasible set of the probability distribution as, as a polyhedron. So what Beth energy does is that it relaxes this cost function with a set that is bigger. So it finds the exterior of this set and that is easier to optimize. And yes. Where does that relaxation happen? So that relaxation happens. So, uh, so basically, you're, set, you're, you're viewing, instead of viewing 
all of the possible marginals. You are viewing only marginals that looks that have, appears in your factors. So your binary marginals, sorry, your unary marginals or your binary marginals if your factors are two, I mean, you can go higher. So you don't focus on all of the arbitrary marginals. So if you have a probability distribution over n random variables, if I can write all pairs of the marginals, how many, how many, const how many pairs I'm going to have? If I have n random variables, all pairs of marginals. Well, only knowing that there exists an edge in the graph. No, no, no. So let's say I want to have a general graph. So I have n random variables, x1, x2, x3. And I'm not going to tell you how they are connected. I'm going to say that I have, I have a discrete random variable, n of them, right? So tell me how many marginals I'm going to have. It should be simple, right? So I have n random variables. Marginals are all of a subset inside of this. So how many are we going to have? Two to the power of n. So if you want to formulate a discrete random variable over the n random variables, you can say that I'm going to formulate all of the marginals, which is 2 to the power of n, and put a constraint there. You just have to put consistency constraint over that, right? The same thing. Do you remember I, I told you this? This is a consistency between marginals. I have to write 2 to the power of n constraint like that. And then I, I formulated my entire space of n random discrete random variables. This is an entire space. It's just a set of, cons set of consistency constraints. But it's a terrible optimization problem because you have exponential constraint. I didn't gain anything. So the, what is happening inside of Beth optimization problem is that it doesn't have exponential constraint. The constraints are basically the factors. So it goes from searching over the space of all of the possible marginals, consistency with your marginals, it goes over a set of Consistency constra constraint that shows up in your factor graph, pretending that's a tree. And that's basically the, what is happening in terms of, if you view it as an optimization, that's basically you, you get rid of some of the constraint. And by getting rid of some of the constraint, you make your space more relaxed, hence bigger. That's the, that's the theory under the hood. I'm good. Yeah, so it's basically what I just, what I just told you, that to, if you have a discrete set of random variables, if I write all of the consistency between marginals, I'll, I'm, done, I'm done. So it's going to be exponential number of random variables, but in LDP, we have ex, uh, polynomial set of random variables, uh, constraint. All right, so that concludes the discussion today.